get now to the second exercise and we want to model now a different type of dynamic. So in this case, it's a thermal dynamic. What we have here, we have my house. That's a representation of my house. And uh, in my house, I have a, a heat source, which is a fireplace powered by pellet, which is the one that you see in the picture. So what is this fireplace doing? It's generating heat by burning uh, uh, pellet. And I want to model, I want to understand by designing a simple dynamic model in Simulink, how the temperature in my house evolves given some uh, uh, characteristic of my house, some characteristic of the fireplace and so forth. As all models, it can be made extremely complicated, but uh, it's always wise to start simple and then uh, eventually, if necessary, uh, complicate the model in order to better characterize the uh, physical behavior of the real system. So in this case, we have a certain amount of limitation that we want to uh, take in consideration in order to simplify our life as much as possible without losing too much uh, representation of the physical system. So the first limitation that we assume is that we don't have any thermal stratification. So the temperature is pretty much constant across the house. There are no rooms, so it's just the same everywhere in the house. The material, uh, the properties of the material are not a function of the temperature. So in this case, the conductivity of the walls, uh, of floors and so on, that's not going to change. Losses are uh, aggregated and, let's say, evenly distributed throughout the the house there is a constant and uniform outside temperature and there is no uh, conditioning so because of air exchange no extra cooling by wind and no solar irradiance throughout the windows so as you can see there is a certain number of uh, assumptions that we are uh, taking in consideration so if we consider all that we can uh, make a fairly simple representation and the mathematical representation of this physical system is pretty much the same of the electrical circuit that we see here in the slide. So we have uh, this electrical circuit, which would represent a, a classical first order uh, uh, electrical system where we have a resistance, a capacitance, uh, a resistor, a capacitor, and a current source. The difference in this case is that instead of having uh, voltages and currents, we have temperature and uh, heat flows. So thermal power. If we keep that in mind, and if we consider that the capacitance is not in farad, but it's a thermal capacitance in joule over Kelvin, and the thermal resistance is not in ohm, but it's a Kelvin over watt, then the mathematical description is exactly the same. And that's what we're gonna do now in Simulink. So let's have a look here at our system. So how do we start to uh, represent our system? We start basically by the simplest uh, subunit. Actually, it's better if I switch back to the slides. So we want to uh, represent the first uh, part of our system. So just to consider the capacitor uh, subject to a certain uh, uh, current. So in this case, to a certain thermal flow. So what we want to realize, we want to implement, as we discussed before, this differential equation, which would be the same uh, that we would have uh, in an uh, electrical capacitor. So in this case, instead of having voltage, we have uh, the derivative of the temperature over time equal to 1 divided the capacitance, thermal capacitance, times the thermal power. And that would be the um, representation of our system. So how do we uh, realize that in uh, Simulink? By, again, using uh, this uh, simple block diagram where we have uh, the integrator. And as an input of the integrator, we have this constant, 5,000, divided by uh, this number, which is 1 million point five. Now, it's extremely important to remember that Simulink doesn't know anything about uh, physics. So Simulink is solving uh, number, it's solving system, uh, differential equation, and so forth. But it's us that is giving the physical interpretation to these numbers. So since I want to represent this thermal model, I assume that this 5,000 uh, as a constant value that I have here 
it's a thermal power in watt. This 11.5 million is my thermal capacitance in joule over Kelvin. Then we have the integrator. And as a result of the physical units that I'm uh, giving to the previous number, the output, so the state of my system, will be the temperature in Kelvin or uh, centigrade degrees uh, Celsius. So what we have now, we have uh, our uh, system. And let's say that uh, we want to model that for one day, so 86,400 seconds. We run it, and I just let Simulink uh, use a uh, uh, variable step solver. What's the output? I think no one should be really surprised by that. I have a constant flow, generated thermal flow in my house. I am assuming at this point that I have no losses, so that would be the zero that I have down here. As a result, the temperature will just keep on increasing linearly. So that shouldn't really surprise us. We can easily understand that that would not really be the, the real case because for how well insulated the house may be, I will always have a certain amount of losses. So let's see how the losses are going to make the difference. So as a first, uh, let's say, degree of complication, we can start adding some losses. And uh, even without characterizing this thermal resistance, we can assume a certain amount of uh, power flowing through the walls. So we can uh, replace this thermal resistance with another uh, current source. So what's going to happen if we replace this uh, zero watt with a new uh, resistance, with a new heat flow, let's say equal to 2000 watt, which we assume to be constant. So we model again. And as a result, as we may expect, the temperature will still keep on increasing linearly, but it will increase at a slower rate. And we will get a lower temperature. You could say, again, this might not really be uh, correct from a physical point of view, because the larger the temperature will get, uh, the larger will be the heat flowing through the walls. I mean, in the end, that would uh, be the classic behavior of, an, uh, of a resistance, regardless if it is an electrical or thermal resistance, the larger the difference between this potential and the other potential, the larger will be the thermal flow uh, flowing. So we can make a further complication. We can say instead of having this constant flow, we can basically characterize just this algebraic equation that is behind this uh, uh, component. So what we have here, we have the temperature over the house minus the temperature of the outside, which I assume to be zero and constant. So I'm just doing this temperature minus this temperature divided by the thermal resistance of my house, which I estimated in being uh, 0 0.01 Kelvin over Watt in the same way as I estimated how to get this 11.6 uh, million joule per Kelvin. So in case we uh, characterize the system in this way, then we model again our system, and we see that uh, something different is happening. So we always assume that the heat flow is a constant over time. But of course, since the temperature is increasing, so is the um, so is the, the difference between the uh, generated heat and the lost heat decreasing. And that means that the rate of increase of the temperature will go down. I guess you may not be that surprised in uh, finding out if we simulate a little bit longer, let's say for a week, that this kind of behavior would resemble, resemble the classic exponential behavior that we would have uh, when we are charging uh, an electrical capacitor, because in the end, that's always the same type of mathematical system that we are solving. So we will reach at a certain point a steady state where our system is in thermal balance. So where the amount of heat that is generated inside the house matches the amount of heat that is lost through the walls and so forth. And that would be the steady state temperature that will be reached. As you can appreciate the dynamics, we are talking about seven days. So that's a, a reasonable uh, time frame for this type of 
system. And as always, we can start to uh, complicate things uh, further. So we can make it a, a little bit, uh, let's say, smarter because we definitely don't want to have the house at 50 degrees. That's pointless. So we want to have actually some kind of basic controller in order to modulate the, the heat, the, the fireplace. And we can start complicating the system, considering also other specific properties. For instance, I may consider that my fireplace takes five minutes to start up. So in order to start uh, to get ready, they it will need to feed pellet inside the in uh, inside the system, and then it will take a while to uh, create the flame and start working properly. So in this case, I could make a simple uh, uh, switch, an on-off, where uh, it, it is, uh, let's say, switching on and switching off the fireplace according to a certain temperature. In this case, it's 20 seconds. And we could have something that looks like that. So now it's basically unreadable, but if we zoom in a little bit down, we can see this kind of behavior, which from a control point of view and also from a system point of view, it's pretty, uh, let's call it not wise, because we, are keep, we keep on having some switch on and switch off continuously, which in the end would just break down our system. That in order to keep this temperature around 20 degrees, which in the end does not really make uh, a lot of sense. So we can complicate the system further by, for instance, considering some uh, uh, hysteresis. And then we can complicate things. We can decide that uh, we can switch it on and off with one degree of difference. And then we can make more and more uh, reasonable models. And that's pretty much it.